We have Kate Davies waiting, who is a staff specialist in general paediatrics at Queensland Children's Hospital. She is the medical lead for patient flow and Queensland Children's at home. She's increasingly interested in alternative models of care for children with acute and chronic illnesses and a strong supporter of KIF. And uh, she's going to really talk about the, the paediatric perspective on um, COVID and respiratory viruses on HIF. Thank you. Thanks so much for um, having me here to speak tonight. I'm the medical lead for Hospital in the Home here at Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane. Um, and we have had limited experience with COVID-19 in the paediatric population here. Um, but I thought um, it might be nice just to start off giving you a little bit of background about our service. It's a fairly small HIF service, um, but it is comprehensive with medical nursing and allied health staff um, available to us. And in its current form um, under medical governance um, model, it has been operational since about August 2019. And prior to that time, it was a nursing led model. We usually have around 10 patients on our service, but we do admit up to 20 or 25 at times of surge. Um, and we have considerable experience in managing children with complex um, respiratory issues such as cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis um, and neuromuscular disease, um, but really only very recent experience in managing children with um, viral respiratory tract infections. And our first experience of that um, was with COVID-19. So very early last year, when we were um, sort of facing potentially having um, a pandemic situation here in Brisbane, we um, sort of jumped at the chance at setting up a hospital in the home model for those children, um, because we really felt that it made sense, particularly in the paediatric population, as the children generally are fairly asymptomatic or have very mild disease. Um, it made sense from the point of view of re reducing risk of transmission to healthcare workers, um, as well as other hospitalised patients. Um, we felt that we would use a lot less PPE in a home environment where you might have a nurse visiting once or twice a day, as opposed to you know, multiple staff members going in and out of a hospital room. It meant that we were able to keep families together. <clears throat> and we were also mindful that infected children generally have an infected parent who is much more likely to become unwell than the child and that the care should really be prioritised for the parent rather than having a child in hospital who may end up without their parent if they become unwell. Um, so we, similar to the model we've just heard about, we really had sort of two arms to our COVID model. One was um, for children who were symptomatic and were requiring either intensive observation or a HIF intervention. And those children received um, at minimum a daily face-to-face -face nursing visit with a medic um, medical telehealth if required and there was always the option for um, a second visit in that same day if it was felt that it was clinically required. Uh, we had a second arm for those children who were minimally symptomatic or perhaps even asymptomatic who just required observation to ensure that they stayed well in the community. Um, we felt that it was important to still have those children under, under a HIF model um, partly to ensure that patients complied with the isolation advice that they were given, um, partly to ensure that we picked them up early if they were becoming unwell, um, but also to be sure that, you know, if they were in a household with a number of parents, a uh, number of carers who were unwell, that those carers were remaining well enough to care for their children. And if not, that they could be brought into hospital, which would be a um, safe environment for them. So those children were managed under a purely telehealth model with daily um, and sometimes second daily telehealth, depending on their clinical requirements. Um, and we shortly converted to a normal um, catchment for our patients are sort of within 40 kilometres by road from our hospital. But being the only paediatric HIF service at the time in uh, the Brisbane metro area, as we were um, caring for those patients under a solely telehealth model, we felt um, that we could actually admit children from anywhere within the metro area to that model of care. Um, and I think there were early on a number of children being managed in adult HIF services, which was causing a little bit of discomfort for those services as well. 
So in the end, our COVID experience was really quite limited. We only had 13 patients admitted um, under our HITH COVID model. Um, they ranged in age between four and four weeks and 14 years of age, and they were mostly um, in return to travellers very early on before the uh, hotel quarantine model was instituted. Um, the majority of the patients either had no symptoms at all or had some mild sort of chorizal upper respiratory tract type symptoms and a few um, went on to have some gastroenteritis as well. Um, only one patient needed to come into hospital and that was the four week old infant just for some closer monitoring for a period of 24 hours, but didn't, uh, even that child didn't need any intervention in the end. So there were quite a lot of challenges um, with managing this cohort, but obviously none of them were clinical because they actually are very well cohort and not really the kind of children that we would usually even have under a HIF model um, because they didn't require very much care at all. Um, the main challenges were keeping our processes up to date with rapidly changing health information, ensuring that our PPE processes for the home environment were um, safe and appropriate. Um, we did a lot of work with managing staff anxiety. You know, nurses uh, worried about entering homes where there was COVID and particularly where there might be adults who were uh, more unwell than the children um, and sort of managing the, the anxiety around that. And we also had a good level of collaboration with other HIF services. So um, sometimes in one family, there'd be adults admitted under an adult HIF service and children admitted under the um, pediatric HIF service. And we felt it was important that only one service would actually go into the home and visit um, the family where possible. And we chose whichever service was uh, the most appropriate at the time. So um, generally speaking, adult nurses aren't overly com comfortable with infants or um, younger children and so we would go into those homes whereas if they were older children an adult service might might go in and telelink back to our service. So following on from that um, I guess gaining that little bit of experience with viral respiratory tract infections and also um, really wanting to prepare for winter last year and not really quite knowing what that would bring and what our hospital capacity issues would be like potentially in the face of um, COVID. We thought, um, you know, what else could we do in this space? And um, back in 2018, I had attended the um, Hith Society meeting um, in uh, Perth where the Perth Paediatric Service presented um, a study that they had done managing um, bronchiolitis in the home environment. And they had done a small RCT with 22 um, infants in each arm managing bronchiolitis at home. And they had had um, good success with that. So I was really keen to try and get um, that model up and running for last winter. Um, we, it's a huge part of our um, workload here in the hospital, a paediatric hospital over winter, managing children with uh, viral bronchiolitis and pneumonitis. And even just in that bronchiolitis cohort, which is infants 12 months and under, we would have over 500 missions per year, um, which really um, involves significant bed utilization for that cohort. Um, and although the Perth experience had been only in those um, children under 12 months, I really wanted to look at expanding that cohort to include older children as well. We thought it would be a safe um, um, model of care for children to be managed at home as the um, course of illness is generally very predictable. Um, and there's good evidence to suggest that management at home is safe. And I guess like all things HIF, when you put people in their home as opposed to a hospital, you reduce the incidence of iatrogenic harm and you reduce the cost to the health service and to the family as well. Um, so there was some evidence in the literature to say that this was safe and the largest um, study that had been done was through Colorado Children's Hospital where then um, had 20, 225 infants over three winters um, being discharged from their ED on home oxygen. Uh, they had a fairly sort of loose model of care where they would observe children in their emergency department for eight hours. And if they were stable, they would send them home. They didn't actually admit them to a HIF service. They just discharged them with some oxygen and asked them to follow up with their community paediatrician the following day. Um, and 
at a phone call on day three, about two thirds of their children had been followed up and a third hadn't. Um, and even despite that sort of what I thought was a fairly loose model, um, only 11 infants required readmission and 88% of families felt that they would do that um, program again in the future. Um, so we set about de developing our own model of care and we set some um, eligibility criteria to try and keep things safe, which included having only admitting um, infants who were over three months corrected gestational age. We felt that really needed observation in hospital for at least 12, if not 24 hours, just to ensure that they were really in that recovery phase of their illness and not um, going to get any worse. Um, they need to be able to maintain their own sort of hydration um, through adequate feeding um, and they need to be on um, no more than one litre per minute of um, subnasal oxygen and part of the reason behind that is you know you're going to capture them in that recovery phase but also just the practicalities around um, delivering large amounts of oxygen to their home. Um, children have to have no more than just mild respiratory distress and the treating paediatrician has to feel that his management is suitable for that patient. Um, we exclude children with any um, comorbidities such as cardiac, uh, pulmonary or neurological conditions. However, we do make an exception for older children where their neurological condition is stable um, and well understood. Um, and we exclude children with a significant sort of ongoing asthma component to their illness, as well as they are more at risk of acute deterioration. Um, so the, what we would actually do when they're admitted to Heath is that we provide a twice daily nursing home visit. Um, and at one of those visits, the nurse will do a telehealth um, back to the hospital with the Heath registrar so they can review the patient as well. Um, at each visit, the nurse does an assessment of the patient's respiratory and hydration status, and they um, connect them to a SATS monitor at the beginning of the visit, observing them for a period of time on their current oxygen level. Um, and if they're stable at 92% or above, they'll wean the oxygen a little and watch for another 15 minutes to ensure that they um, remain well on that new setting. So the oxygen is weaned just incrementally, um, no more than twice per day, just due to the feasibility of offering more than twice daily visits. Um, and we don't leave an oxygen uh, saturation monitor in the home because I think the temptation um, for parents to respond to every small change in oxygen sats is just too tempting. Um, and the first patient that we sent home under this model did accidentally get sent home with a SATS monitor and it took us 12 days to get that baby off oxygen. So we had our pathway written and endorsed ready for winter 2020, but then due to social distancing, um, we really did not experience a winter season here in um, Brisbane last year. And so we had very, very few patients admitted to the hospital with acute viral illness last winter and subsequently had no patients at all admitted to HITH um, last year for a viral or respiratory tract infection. However, this year in February 2021, we've experienced a 300% rise in RSV this year as social distancing and, and isolation measures have relaxed and we now have a cohort of children who are not RSV immune. Um, and so it's been hitting the media a lot here and I'm sure it's probably no different elsewhere around Australia. Um, so while that's really um, unfortunate for the children of Brisbane and also for our hospital who's had sustained um, capacity issues over the last three months, uh, sorry, um, the last six weeks, um, it's really been a very optimal environment for us to launch our um, new pathway. So we're very early in our journey with this patient cohort, um, but we've um, gaining experience rapidly over the um, last four to six weeks. Um, some challenges that we've come up is that it's a fairly resource intensive pathway um, requiring some training for parents before they can go home with the oxygen. We provide twice daily nursing visits, which is a challenge for our team. We just have a small nursing team of nine FTE um, and we also um, provide a daily telehealth with the HITH registrar. Uh, we found that it's a shift in practice for both nursing staff and a change of expectations for parents as they're 
the children are generally continuously monitored whilst they're in hospital from a SAPS point of view, um, and they go home and just have twice daily saturation checks. Um, and I guess the other point that we've already to started to consider is that perhaps our eligibility criteria are too conservative, though we really want to make sure that this is a safe um, pathway before we get too um, excited about rolling it out um, beyond the current cohort. So I guess just to sum up um, our experience so far of pediatric HIF and viral lower respiratory tract infection is that we feel it's safe and effective. It allows families to stay together and at home. Um, and it's a significant cost and bed saving to the hospital as well as set cost saving to the family. Um, and there is reduced risk of iatrogenic harm. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a really super interesting talk, took us through really two programs. And for me, the interesting thing was that the similarities in a way between SEOX COVID program and your paediatric you know, RSV program. Um, we're going to need to wrap up soon, but we might have a, a few very brief questions. Um, I can't see any on the Q&A. So SEOX, I'm going to ask you one first, which is about your patients that you looked after in the community with COVID, about the ones that deteriorated and needed to go into hospital, what, what proportion of patients was that? And how did you get them into hospital? How did that all work to get somebody, you know, with COVID at home into a hospital ward in a, in a no fast manner? The standard way we did, uh, we got people without COVID into the hospital, which is call someone from the hospital, call a clinician from the hospital, which is the COVID consultant in this case, but call a clinician who'd be uh, sort of happy to take handover and look after their care in hospital. And um, then uh, discuss whether they feel like they would be safe enough to drive in, or often if they're hypoxic, then it would require an ambulance transfer into a hospital. Um, probably the tricky cases, in 99% of the time, it was not a problem. What was trickier sometimes were there was people who did not want to come into hospital, so people with PTSD. Um, due to the psychosocial backgrounds, people who had been in war-torn countries, um, who just did not trust government and did not want to be in a government facility. Um, and there we had some trickier uh, bouts of, uh, I guess, thinking about, you know, we deliver uh, oxygen and dexamethasone to the home, knowing that that was really not quite what, would, what the literature would uh, recommend um, versus uh, trying to get a community care leader to be involved in the conversation about getting them into hospital. Okay, look, thank, thank you for that. Yeah, I think we've all faced those challenges with patients that don't want to come into hospital, whether it's COVID or anything else. Um, Kate, Kate, I wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned something which I think we've all thought a lot about with COVID, but you probably deal with every day, which is you know, about caring for the whole family unit rather than just caring for the person admitted to your HIT program. And, you know, I, I don't know if you could give us some pearls of wisdom on how you do that through the, the paediatric HIT service. Sure. Um, I guess I was reflecting before um, with some of the conversations that were happening earlier on about, you know, really involving um, other family members and carers um, in the care of the HIF patient. And I guess for us, that's just standard BAU. You know, our patients generally don't care for themselves. Um, and so we have the patient, but also their carers who are really proactively involved in their care. Um, um, and we really rely on them to escalate, you know, any concerns that they're having at home. Um, I noticed someone put there on the Q&A, um, do we have a hotline for COVID patients to call in or any patient to call in if they're um, deteriorating? We certainly do. We have a 24-7 nurse on call um, and we rely on that parent to escalate their concerns. Um, we do involve parents very heavily in the care, particularly in some of our other cohorts. Um, you know, where parents are administering antibiotics at home, at times they're administering sub medications, they're even at times accessing central lines and giving fluids and things like that. And obviously we have to tailor that to every individual family based on what their capacity um, may or may not be to do that. Um, but yeah, I think we have usually minimum two patients, the child and a parent, and sometimes many more who are involved in their care. Fantastic, thank you. I think that's something we really, 
adopted to quite quickly with COVID as adult clinicians. Um, I'm going to wrap up tonight because we have gone over time with some technical issues and also because we've had fantastic speakers. And I really would like to thank all the speakers tonight, you know, for coming on and sharing their stories and um, information. Um, also, of course, the sponsors of this series, um, CRE Reduce for really organising it and doing all the grunt work. And don't forget, there will be a recording available on the YouTube channel. Um, there are three more great um, sessions planned for this year, so please stay tuned. And because we have run short on time, if you do have any questions, feel free to email the speakers. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great night.